because we, we got to get going right. You know? <laughs> That's right. We had a slow countdown this morning. Uh, this is Shelly Hoffman with Hard Home Community, and I'm here with Bob Wicks, who most of you now know is the supervisor in the town of Lysander. Uh, you know, Bob and I were talking every week when uh, COVID first started affecting us, and we've gone to the, the first Monday of the month now. So, Bob, I appreciate you taking the time to kind of give us an update now on, you know, the town of Lysander and, you know, what's been happening around our area. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And again, I appreciate you taking the time to do this for us. Thank you. I am, um, like I said, I always enjoy the information myself. So hopefully other people do as well. But um, so how has phase two hit? What has what uh, changed in the in the town and in the, in the offices and stuff since, um, you know, we've gotten a little bit farther with the opening of some businesses? Well, I mean, it's good news for the citizens. The town's actually open. Um, the last two, three weeks, I've been really working on our policies, our COVID policies for the employees, and we had to develop those first. And that was, uh, you had to start from ground zeros uh, and, and work all the way through them. That took uh, quite a bit of, of work and effort to get those in place. We have those in place. And there's also, we had to develop some policies for citizens coming into the town uh, so that uh, they're safe, the employees are safe. So the town offices are now open. I mean, when people come in, it's going to be, it's going to look a little different, obviously. So when you come into the town offices, everyone's going to have to wear a mask. That's the first thing, you know, nobody, everybody that they're going to deal with is going, going to be wearing a mask and people coming into the building are going to be wearing a mask. And we're fortunate because we have a large lobby area. So when people come in, we're going to be able to make sure that they have their social distancing. And then when they go, there's windows set up so that um, they're protected from the employees and the employees are protected from anyone coming in the building. But when you first come into the building, you're going to have to fill out a uh, screening sheet, a screening form, which uh, has a number of things on. But essentially, you're attesting that you haven't been around anybody with COVID and you don't have any COVID and you're not sick at the time. So you take that, you fill out that form, you take that form to the window. And as long as every everything's answered no on it, then uh, you're going to be able to be serviced. And even if there's a yes on there, we would have to work something else out, maybe do, do it outside. They wouldn't be allowed to stay in the building. But um, the uh, there's going to be um, at the at the door, you're going to have sanitizer there. And, and when somebody comes to a counter, after they come to a counter, the employees are going to sanitize anything that uh, anybody touched uh, from the outside so that the next person coming in will be safe. And that's, it's been taking a lot of effort and time and getting all the employees prepared for that. And, and honestly, like, because you are, you know, one of the leaders in the community, watching how you're opening the business, people are probably kind of taking, um, you know, a step back to watch that because you do have a lot of different people from the public that come in. Pretty much everybody in our community at some point has probably stepped into the building. Um, so how are you keeping everybody safe? It's, it's a good way to know how you're doing it in case somebody's waiting to open their office to see how they should do it as well. Um, when you say people are filling out the form and then coming up to the window, do they have to wait? Kind of like um, silly example, but at Wegmans, you know, you stand back and then the cashier wipes everything down and then the next person comes up. Is it kind of the same thing if somebody walks away from the window, the next person would just have to wait until everything gets wiped down or, um, you know, how are you, how are you monitoring that? But we're lucky that we don't have the amount of volume that way. <laughs> you never know, Bob. <laughs> uh, even if we did, uh, we're still, uh, uh, because of the governor's um, executive order, we still can't allow any more than 10 people in that lobby area at any time. So the likelihood of that happening isn't you know, very likely. Uh, you might have one at each window, but as soon as the people leave, yes, the the employees are going to clean that down. Uh, they may not see them clean them down, but they're, you know, I mean, unless they're standing there, uh, would, uh, they would wipe them down. But uh, yeah, that's that's what's going to occur. And really, I've been at, obviously, I got my hair cut uh, and uh, they're doing, businesses are doing a great job. We can take, uh, uh, really take, watch how businesses are doing like McDonald's. I mean, McDonald's, I saw what they're doing. They're doing a great job. And, and I actually looked at what they were doing and uh, kind of modeled what we were going to do after that. And But everybody's doing about the same thing. People are coming in. They got to stand back. There's lines on the uh, floor to know where you should stand. Nobody's going to creep up on somebody else. Uh, we're going to clean before, clean after, and everybody's wearing masks. So uh, I think that 
if we do that, people are pretty used to it right now. Um, and, and with the summertime coming along, it's clear that the warmer weather, the humidity, the, uh, the sunlight with the UV rays, uh, that's going to affect the COVID as well. Yeah, and all, and all that, um, you know, it gives a little bit more hope and people want to be outside. He said, you know, if you're outside, you're breathing um, air that's been dispersed. What about um, things in the community? Anything, um, you know, new or um, going out that you've seen in the community that you want to talk about this week? Well, uh, I think that uh, Chief Lefinchak talked about it yesterday. And like I was discussing with you earlier, uh, the chief really isn't in a position to promote himself, but I'm going to promote him today and his police department, as well as the rest of the police departments in our county. All you have to do is look at what's happening around uh, the state and around the country to see how effective our local leaders are. I think that even though we had some disruption and we had some rioting and some damage on uh, Saturday night, the, uh, the mayor, the police chief, the county executive, they got together with and they notified the uh, uh, all the town supervisors and all the police chiefs. They got together, came up with a plan, and you can see the result of that plan, how effective they were. Because uh, Sunday night, they didn't have uh, uh, any riding, and we haven't had it so far. Just as close as Rochester, they had a much different outcome. But that's uh, an example of what this community has been doing with their policing over the years. Now, I'm not going to uh, pretend that uh, the police in this community over since I've been a cop, I, I was a cop, I'm not a cop anymore, but for 30, the 39 years that I was, this community has been uh, a leader in the country as far as how we deal with things. Bowensville in the 70s had a chief by the name of Tim Paul, and he introduced the type of policing that they still continue on with today. He was, Bowensville has always been since, since I've been a cop, has been a, uh, what other town and villages should aspire to be like. As a matter of fact, when I was the chief of Marcellus, I took uh, the Bowensville's model and I took the sheriff's department's model and incorporated it into my model over there. And again, this, uh, the sheriff's department under John Dillon was the same way. He was way ahead of things back in the 70s. And that's when I came on in the early 80s. We were the first one to have uh, training for the police officers uh, field training program. That was that was a brand new concept. And he in introduced that into the sheriff's department there, which I went through, which was not easy. It, you, it was very demanding. But Bowensville, the sheriff's department and the state police, all three police agencies that police our community are really um, examples of what police should be like policing communities. Now, there's always room for improvement. I think there's we should uh, we should be looking to uh, really get out how we address the community, especially in these urban areas. But I think right now we're doing a very good job. But, you know, we have to keep moving forward. But Bowensville provides a great service. The sheriff's department provides a great service. And so does the state police. Now, in saying that, when uh, I don't recall any any issues like we we saw any um, use of force issues in Bonesville over my 39 years. I just don't recall it. But with the sheriff's department, we had a couple, and I can tell you that the sheriff uh, addressed them right away because you can have people coming in, and when they when they act outside their authority, they're not acting with police authority. They're acting with criminal intent, and they're criminals just like anybody else. And when they do, they should be arrested and they should be prosecuted. And that's what we have to do a better job as as a uh, police organization in policing ourselves. And I'm sure that what's going on now is going to uh, lead to that. Um, and, and I think what one of the things I did when I was in Marcellus, when I, I was developing, I had, I had three school districts and I had school resource officers in each district. Now, I would select a, a number of police officers that met my criteria, I vetted them, and then I would um, give a list of names of uh, potential candidates to the schools, and the schools would actually pick the individual that they would want. I think this is this is a model that maybe we can use moving forward. Uh, if uh, community leaders got together with uh, police and if they had a uh, an officer that's in an area that they don't think is policing their area, well enough, that might be a way to go and talk to the police chief, especially in urban areas, and say, hey, we need somebody else there. And the police 
should uh, respond to that. If they got somebody that isn't policing their neighborhood the way that they should, the police, uh, you know, they should be vetted by the police. You know, they just can't pick anybody they want. There should be a, but there's always a number of people that would uh, fill that need um, professionally. But the community should be able to have some sort of say in how their community is policed. Well, and, and everything is um, personality. And if I understand what you're saying correctly, it doesn't mean that particular person isn't doing a great job. It's just maybe not the correct vibe for that community or something. I know that uh, McNamara Elementary School, there's a, um, a resource officer over there that just fits so well with the school when you see the videos and the way that she relates with the kids. And, and I'm sure it's the same at Jergy and Baker High School and stuff, just different personalities. But, um, but you do want to feel safe. You want to feel comfortable. And I, and I talked a little bit to Chief Leffenchek about that yesterday is, um, you know, I'm a resident now in the village. And just, you know, hearing that they were out policing a little bit more, even though our village was calm, there was really nothing happening um, Saturday night or Sunday night in our village. It was reassuring to know that they were out there because you have trust and faith in the people that, you know, are out there to protect and serve. But I can see why, um, you know, the community should have a good feeling about the person that's working that area, if I'm understanding you correctly. Well, I, I think that uh, Baldwinsville, I think that they would be responsive to that. But. I, I mean, the uh, school resource officer that's in Van Buren School, uh, and, and I apologize for not remembering her name. I'm, I'm embarrassed that I can't because I've met her a number of times. It'll come to me after we get off the, uh, off the air here. But she, uh, uh, she is at a school where my grandkids are there, and they love her. And uh, I've been in and I've talked to her, and she's the type of uh, police officer that you want in your community. And uh, I've known uh, the chief for, you know, all 33 years of his uh, um, career. I, I met him when he was in the uh, police academy. So, you know, I know the type of individual that he is. He is. And the, there's, uh, like I said, there, there's just a lot. We have a lot of good police policing our community. But one of the other things I wanted to talk about, when the county executive put out a curfew, the curfew, you know, people, and I, and I heard you, Shelly, uh, explaining that, well, I want to walk my dog and things like that. And I understand that. And people, you know, I understand people want to get out and if they don't have any place to walk their dog, they got to do that. And that's not what he put it out there for. But why there's a curfew, the curfew's out there because the county executive thought that it would be dangerous for citizens to be out walking the streets after a certain period of time. So it's for their protection, not not for not to try and uh, impose any type of authority, at least in this community, not to impose any type of authority. But, uh, you know, I, I still have um, connections with the police community. My son's a trooper. My wife's a court officer. So we were getting information. You know, I was getting information from my wife about different things. And there was a, a concern uh, with people in the suburbs that, you know, something could go on and, and you don't know where it's going to be. So the curfew isn't, isn't a stifle people. It's for their protection, just so they understand that. No, and that, and that's a good explanation. Like I said, the, the social media sometimes, you know, it, it's a place to, to vent people just, you know, you send something out and then 30 minutes later, you're like, Oh, why did I even type that? Um, but it's, you know, it is a little bit scary to think that we have a curfew or that we're living in a time where that happens. And, you know, the protests, there have been some great peaceful protests. I woke up this morning, went on my Facebook page, and they were talking about people dancing, you know, at one of the, the protests. It's, just, it's like kind of a, a un, unity type of activity, right? I mean, dancing, and there's a lot of things that you can do that are not destructive, that show you're, you're forming unity and, um, and working together. So not everything is, is negative like you see over and over and over again. It's nice with baseball people having the control to show some positive things that are happening out there as well, I think. People people need a way to express their displeasure with the government. And how do they do that? They do it through protesting. Now, the things that you, that I was watching on TV today at night where they were going in and looting and, and running over police with cars, that's not protesting. That's rioting. That's, that's criminal activity. That's not the same thing. But protest. That's that's everybody's right. And they should do it. And people should be upset with what they saw in Minnesota. I was upset with it. I didn't like it. It it was disturbing. And my like I said, my family's involved in law enforcement. I have a lot of friends involved in law enforcement. I can tell you to the person, nobody thought that was that was acceptable. In fact, 
it was it was they were disgusted by what they saw there because like we were discussing earlier i'm not you know everybody has their due process rights but at the very least those police officers there were violating their own training and policies i can tell you explicitly i know what they've been trained in over the last 15 years because i was involved in it they violated that at the very least and you saw the outcome that's why they're trained not to do what they did because of what the outcome was uh but police in this community they don't they don't accept that i've never seen that i've never been involved uh with anything like that never seen anybody do anything like that and the police that i know if they would have seen something like that going on they would have intervened and that wouldn't have happened so that that's just uh, uh, just not good on that part. And people should be upset and should. And if they feel they should get out and protest, they should. They have the right to do that. They should do it. Yeah, I was. Um, it was interesting to hear uh, the chief say yesterday that they're trained to stop it because you know someone like myself who has known nothing really about law enforcement other than the rules and the laws that I try and not get in. You know, I I try and follow. Um, I wondered myself, is there some kind of a code? Like, why didn't they step in? Is there, you know, is there something that you can't do? It's just not done. And according to the chief yesterday, there's training where you, uh, he said, at least around here, you are trained to, to step in and stop something if you think um, that it's crossing a line. Those are people that what you saw there was the worst example of what police should be. They, there were three other people there should have intervened right away. And I can tell you, yes, we're all taught to intervene. I mean, you're not, if you see somebody engaged in criminal activity, if you see somebody walking in, we go through buildings at night and we, uh, we're, we're, we have access to everybody's property. If you see somebody picking up uh, some property and sticking it in their pocket, they're committing a crime. They're going to get arrested. And the people that I know, the people that I've been involved with over my 39 years, they would all do that. They would not allow that to occur. And yes, they are trained to intervene. With something like that, police are trained to intervene. So those police weren't doing what they were trained to do. I can tell you, I know what the training is. I helped develop it back in the 80s and 90s, and, and that's called positional asphyxia. And uh, we've been uh, training police officers in that for at least 15 years, to, not to restrict their breathing because of what could happen, because uh, you could cause, uh, they, they could die when their uh, breathing is restricted. And and police across the country have been trained in that for over a decade. Now I am, um, and obviously, you know, the chief mentioned yesterday, he, you know, he's not in a position where we were talking, maybe he didn't say it, that, you know, when you're in that position, you. It, you know, it's hard because you're watching a fellow officer, somebody that you typically stand by and support, you know, doing something. And um, the chief said yesterday that he's assuming that the chief of, in that area out, out there is doing what he needs to do um, and, and taking all the correct steps. But as a public, it was really hard to watch. And it is nice to see protests. And I've talked to my kids about the reason there's protest. You know, we talked about that a little bit. So it's, it's nice to hear the officials of our community saying you have the right to protest if you want to you know put something together in a peaceful protest and and show that you're concerned and you're upset it's your right to do so so it is nice to hear that not everything needs to turn to violence and and rioting no it shouldn't i mean you know they go back to i mean the, there are people always talk about martin luther king you never saw martin luther king throwing any rocks in fact he got arrested numerous times he they were always peaceful protest and he got his message out now not everybody's as eloquent as him but there uh he did get his message out and you don't have to be a great order to get the information out that you you are upset with what you're doing gather in a group and then force your leaders to do the things that they're paid to do to do the things that they took an oath to do and i i can tell you like with with these large police departments i have a friend of mine that's the chief of police out in uh, Sacramento. And uh, that's an 800 person uh, police department. In fact, he's the first black police chief of that police department ever. And uh, I, I know him uh, intimately. I met him at the FBI uh, National Academy. And, and I know that Dan Hahn does not subscribe to anything like that. But 
you have set, he has uh, 700 and uh, uh, almost 800 uh, employees there. Could somebody do something crazy or criminal at some time without his authorization, without him being able to intervene? Sure they could. But then I, I can tell you right now that Dan Hahn would be all over that. He would address it right away. And he's not the only one, like Chief Leftencheck said. I'm sure the police chief in uh, Minnesota wasn't condoning that, but he's got a, Minneapolis is a huge city. So there's probably hundreds and hundreds of employees that at any given time, if they decide to do something criminal, it's impossible to stop that. In the moment it's happening, absolutely. So, um, well, I, um, you know, again, we're, we're a small community here in Baldwinsville in a small city like Syracuse, but I don't know. I mean, you're right, there's been some vandalism and stuff, but based on what we're seeing on the news, you know, as always, I, I just, I say it all the time, I love where we live. I love the people that um, surround here. For the most part, it's a pretty respectful place to live. We have our ups and downs, we have crime, we have, you know, but, I don't know. It just feels like a very caring community. I've been talking to my friends and we're talking to our kids about protests. They've read it in books, you know, in history and they've learned it in lessons. And this is something for them to actually um, understand why those things happen. It's, it's an outrage that we're going through this as a country. So um, in, in some regards, it's it's eye opening to my kids who have just always lived in like a little small suburban place. And they're they're getting a dose of what really can happen out there. Um, you but know, you have thousand, just about 800,000 police in the United States. And I mean, if you really break it down, how many of these instances occur? And criminal activity can, can be involved in any uh, profession, doctors, lawyers, uh, judges, um, you, you name it. Any public official can, can be involved in criminal activity. And the thing is that police are not, uh, are not exempt from that. I mean, you're going to have that from time to time. But that doesn't mean that the police condone it. In no. fact, they don't, like I said. And uh, I mean, most of the police that, uh, uh, I mean, most of them, uh, just about every every police officer that goes to work, they're just like you and I and everybody else. They have a family. They want to do the right thing. They get involved in this uh, profession for the right reasons. And uh, But when they come out, when people are throwing bricks at them and rocks, you're throwing bricks and rocks at at some uh, father, some brother, some uh, son, you know, some uh, wife or some sister. I mean, they're they they agree with you, but they have a job to do. But for when people start doing that type of stuff, that's just wrong as well. It's just as wrong as what her, uh, what the other police did. Yeah. So, well, I guess in the next couple of days we'll see how things start to, um, you know, keep keep continuing and, and playing out. I just. Um, I don't know, sometimes I'm at a loss of words, which if you know me and you're getting to know me, Bob, it's not often I'm at a loss of words. <laughs> but well, it, you know, it's overwhelming. The nice thing, yeah, yeah, I, listen, I, um, I was, uh, not a lot of things rocked me, but I was distressed uh, this past week, and so was my wife, with what we saw. I mean, it just, it just is not good for anybody. I mean, it's, you know, I'm concerned with uh, with my uh, wife and my son that are involved in police work. I'm concerned with my grandkids that have to grow up with this type of environment. And it's uh, it's distressing. But the, the good thing about where we live is that we have a very, very tolerant community. It's not perfect. No, no place is. But if you go around the country and look at uh, how communities are divided, uh, across uh, socioeconomic and racial lines, we we have some of that, but not a lot. I mean, we are on the very bottom end of that. Um, we we have room for growth. There's no doubt about it. We we can make uh, progress in that area, but we are a very very tolerant community, a very very um, caring uh, community for each other. And you could just see it in, in what's been going on in our community with this COVID thing, how uh, volunteer groups got together helping their neighbors and uh, going out and uh, delivering food and uh, going helping people that are uh, elderly people that are stuck in their house or running to the store for them. And that, that was just people just deciding to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, you know, makes you, <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is think about that and it makes you feel a little bit better. You know, it, it's funny you say that because it's almost like um, everything that's happened in the last 20 days has overshadowed right? 
So it's important for like you just did to bring it back up to the front and, and, and say that there's so much good out there and, and people wanting to help and being supportive of each other. Um, it's just weird how COVID was the focus for so long, you know, and the social distancing and we're still trying to do that. But then when you think of the, the protests and all that, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, um, it's, 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 it's strange to watch so many people gathered in a space and know at the same time we're trying to social distance. So, yeah. I mean, the, the protest, that doesn't bother me. I think, I, I think that's a good idea. I think that's a way for people to express their opinions when they don't believe that they're being hurt. What's distressing is the rioting, the rioting, the destruction of property, the destruction of property in minority neighborhoods. I mean, I heard a fireman. Uh, he was a black fireman, him and his wife. Uh, they, uh, he had to be relieved from duty. He was out working. He had to be relieved from duty because rioters and uh, looters were, went into his bar that he had saved up his whole life for and just trashed his bar. And he and his wife were almost inconsolable. And, you know, that's the, that's the people that are being hurt. So the rioting and looting is very, very distressing. I mean, um, you know, hopefully people, uh, when they talk about GoFundMe pay, because this is where people should go and help those two individuals out, help those two individuals out to start their business up. But that, that wasn't the neighborhood uh, peacefully protesting. That was outside agitators coming in that are just uh, bent on the disruption of our uh, social structure and our government. Yeah. They're, and they're ruining, they're ruining people's lives. Well, and, and I had mentioned to um, one of my girlfriends is sometimes they don't even know whose lives they're ruining. You know, they're not they're not they're not targeting a person. They're just, you know, the riot is uncontrolled. So the person they may end up hurting is what may have been somebody they were actually, quote unquote, protest, protect, um, protesting for, you well, know, because we don't know who owns all the businesses. The I, the yeah. people that are looting and rioting, they, they mm -hmm. don't care about anybody other than uh, pushing their own agenda. And, and it crosses all racial and socioeconomic lines. The, the uh, protesting, that's a different situation. The looting and rioting is a whole different thing. Those people don't care. They, they come in with their Molotov cocktails, they come in with their bricks, and then they just start smashing. They don't care. They don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, white or black, male or female, rich or poor. They're, if they see something that they want, they're going to loot it. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's the, the whole thing leaves me speechless. I just don't, um, I don't know what to say. I feel so bad for so many different people out there, people that are losing their businesses because of COVID, you know, people that are struggling now because of the rioting and the looting. And then obviously the people that are just sad um, because of the, um, because where uh, police brutality was happening or it's happened to them or, um, you know, I watched quite a few videos, more videos than I probably ever watched in my life this past week. Um, and it was really eye opening to see different views coming in from all races. And, you know, it, it didn't matter what what nationality somebody was, their their opinions matter, their opinions count and they're starting to voice them. And I think it's having a little bit of a, more of an impact now because everybody's listening and watching. So, but again, that's just my my two cents on it. But my eyes water a bit this week, Bob, <laughs> and watching a lot of the stuff that's happening. Yeah. And it is distressing. Listen, we and and what's going to happen? I mean, we were this this um, uh, state and our community is going to be really impacted by COVID as far as uh, this type of support that we're going to get. And we rely on state support. Now you add in this this other stuff that's going on, all the cost that's going to be associated with uh, the rioting and disruption that you're seeing throughout the state. That's just going to jack it up. And now where where businesses would be able to reopen, now they can't reopen because they they got looted or their place got burned down. I mean, this is going to be a financial impact on us as well. And but the people that are doing that rioting and looting, they aren't locals. They're they're coming from out of state. They're coming from out of state. They don't care what happens in New York state. That's why it's good when when I see people uh, there were in Philadelphia. A neighborhood got together and they actually uh, provided a um, w would not allow looters to come in and loot the local target. The local target was there for the community. The community got together, went over and they prevented looters from getting into their target. And that's how people have to look at it. It's their neighborhood. It's their businesses and they need to protect their businesses. And how do you do it? You start first by 
making sure that the uh, public officials are listening to them and not just talking rhetoric. They have to do something. They have to get out and they have to show the people that they're actually going to do something about it. Substantial, not just talking points. Well, like I said, we'll see as it continues to play out. Everything you said is always good information. I mean, a lot of your background, obviously, being um, part of the police force and now being, you know, in politics with the town supervisor. Um, I think that you have so much value to add to the conversation. So I always appreciate you know, your input, Bob. Um, is there anything that you want to, else you want to mention to our community before we sign off for today? Well, I, I think that just, you know, just like you, people are going to be distressed. But the one good thing, just, just try to just remember that you live in a, you live in a very safe community, one of the safest in the country. You live in a, in a safe uh, um, city, one of the safest relatively safe. I mean, like I said, we have our problems, but we live in, we, we have our government officials, our county executive, uh, the, the mayor, our police chiefs are all listening to people. I mean, they're doing a great job so they can take, uh, you know, take that back and that they should feel good about that. That's what people should feel good about. And so even though things are going on around us, you know, it's not going to be easy. Like I said, this is, we're going to be in for some bumpy roads. But at least in our our small piece of the world, we're in pretty good shape across the board. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And that's a good that's a good note to leave this on, too, is to, you know, we said it when it was COVID that we need to focus on our, our community and then reach out to the county and then to the state and then, you know, focus, focus inward. And the same thing, if you focus inward, it is um, central New York, Baldwinsville. It's, it really is a great, nice place to live in, and people are open-minded. There's a lot of conversations happening out there in our area, and they're all very respectful conversations that I'm hearing. I'm sure there's some negativity somewhere, but um, for the most part, what I'm seeing is all positive, um, open-minded discussions, which is which is nice to, to be a part of and to hear. So thank you for uh, taking the time, Bob. <laughs> I know this is a little bit longer than we normally go, but uh, but I enjoyed the information that you were sharing and your point of view. So again, um, you know, thank you again, and so happy to have you here as part of our community in Baldwinsville. Well, thanks for having me on.